Russia has chosen the Assad regime again over the unity of this council. It's a travesty. They have now officially vetoed resolutions that would hold these barbaric uses of chemical weapons attacks by Assad six times. History will record that. History will, will record that on this day, Russia chose protecting a monster over the lives of the Syrian people. That was Ambassador Nikki Haley responding to Russia's sixth veto of a U.N. resolution regarding Syria's use of chemical weapons. It comes as NBC News has learned that Russia has been jamming the GPS systems of some U.S. military drones in Syria. According to four U.S. officials, it has seriously affected American military operations in the country. Joe, do you think that uh, the U.N. ambassador's statements will have an impact? Well, I think they do have an impact. They certainly have an impact around the United Nations and are heard across the globe. I, you know, Mika, you, you never know how governors are going to make the transition from uh, running a state government to being thrust onto the international stage. You and I heard some very unkind things mm -hmm. from inside the Trump White House early on that suggesting from uh, national security staff that she may not be up to the job. It seems to me it's just the opposite is the case. Nikki Haley has been doing a, 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 an extraordinary job at the United Nations. And uh, Richard Haas, it seems yeah. to me that Nikki Haley also at the United Nations uh, has promoted American values as well as any U.N. ambassador we could hope to have. And seems to me that despite what the commander in chief is saying in the White House, at least in New York at the U.N., Nikki Haley seems to be fighting uh, to continue down the path of, of, of more traditional U.S. foreign policy, post-war uh, foreign policy. Um, what are your thoughts about uh, the job she's doing there, at least in the words that she's saying and condemning uh, these heinous acts? Well, she's been very tough on, on Russia, as, as we heard. She's been effective at getting new sanctions against North Korea. She's been uh, in, you know, strongly uh, defending uh, of Israel. But going back to Mika's uh, question, you know, will this have impact on Russian behavior vis-a-vis -vis Syria? The short answer is no. That's also probably an unfair test for the U.S. permanent representative at the United Nations. That's too much to ask. But Russia's clearly unconditionally citing with Bashar al-Assad, and it's going to, we'll talk about it later, I expect, Joe, but it's going to significantly complicate U.S. military planning. And this is part of a larger narrative where Vladimir Putin's Russia is essentially saying in every way he can, in every language he can, that we are not part of, quote, unquote, the West or the international community. We are pursuing our own narrow national interest as we see it in Ukraine, in Syria, using cyber. And essentially, we don't care what you say. We don't care what, mm. what you think. We don't care what you do with sanctions or anything else. Russia is an outlier. It's that simple. So if you're drawing up a plan for the president, if you're talking to James Mattis or John Bolton or anybody on the president's national security team, what is the best step forward to put Russia back on their heels in Syria? Well, I think the best step forward we took the other day were these very significant economic sanctions. And I would continue to do that because that's an area where Russia can't respond. There's no symmetry that's uh, available to them as opposed to, for example, kicking out diplomats, which is a big mistake. But I think the in Syria, what it does is it means you've got to think twice or three times before ever using U.S. aircraft because the, you can't now discount the possibility of Russian uh, defensive re, uh, reactions. And you've got the complications against drones or even cruise missiles. It just complicates what it is you're going to do. Coming back to the conversation you and I had earlier this week, what it does is it raises the importance not simply of how we respond in a punitive way, but it raises the question of what we do going forward. And I think the most significant thing we do in Syria is we find a way to keep those few thousand U.S. troops there in an open-ended way, and we work more closely than ever before with the Syrian Kurds to help them, and we look for ways to help the Syrian people. So we don't just think about a short-term punitive response. We think about a long-term response that affects the future of Syria. With Vladimir Putin and Russia <clears throat> in the Middle East for the first time since 1973, 1974, uh, is there 
any option for the United States to remove those 2,000 troops out, or would it be catastrophic, and would it be ceding that entire region to Russia, to Iran, to ISIS, to uh, Assad, to, to actually our three or four uh, greatest enemies on the globe? It would not just be a moral stain on the United States, probably more than anything else. This, this would then become the equivalent of Barack Obama's red line. If right now Donald Trump, after everything that's happened, after everything he said, after everything he's tweeted, after everything the Russians, the Syrians, the Iranians have done, if he were to take U.S. forces out, people would be, it would be fair to say this is his red line moment. He has blinked, and the United States cannot be taken seriously in the Middle East. Mm. Joining us now, the author of the report on the Russians jamming U.S. GPS, NBC News National Security and military reporter Courtney Kuby. Courtney, good morning. Good to see you. Um, let's pick up this conversation here about Syria. You have Russia saying, we've gone in and checked. There were no chemical weapons used in that attack that killed at least 60 people. That's the Russian and Syrian position. They've said if the United States launches missiles at Syria, those missiles will be intercepted and the source of those missiles will be attacked by Russian forces. So with all this in play, what is the White House, what is the Defense Department considering in terms of response to the alleged chemical attack in Syria? So there's several different options that are on the table. One of them, of course, is similar to what we saw last April in 2017 after the devastating first chemical weapons attack when the U.S. launched about 60 tomahawks in. That was really more of a, a, a strike that was to send a message to the Assad regime. The U.S. was saying, we know where this, strike, this, this attack came from. We know what aircraft carried it out. They pocked up the runways, but it didn't really have a big operational or practical impact on the ground or in the Syrian military's operations. Another option would be something slightly more aggressive. The U.S. officials that I've been speaking with seem to think that this is where this international response is going to fall, is some sort of a slightly larger uh, response, more broader response, which would include, you know, other U.S. allies being involved. Um, it would include probably going after maybe some, some Bashar al-Assad command and control. So something that would actually have more of an impact than, than halting operations at one Syrian military base for one day, which is what we saw in April of 2017. And then, of course, the most aggressive option would be for the United States and France, Britain, whatever countries were willing to go in on this, to actually go after not just Syrian military, but Iranian and even Russian military targets. Now, we've seen some pretty aggressive language out of the Russian military. When they talk about going after the U.S., any kind of a U.S. asset that would be responsible for this, they're talking about U.S. military ships in the Med. They're talking about right. potentially U.S. military aircraft. That is very aggressive language, and it is something that the Russians can actually back up with action. They have an, uh, an advanced anti-air defense system. It's called the S-400. It's sitting on top of a mountain in Aleppo, and it is, it's an integrated air defense system that is, is integrated with, with both Russian and Syrian military all over the country. So they can actually take out an aircraft or a cruise missile that's coming into the country pretty reliably if they wanted to. And that's exactly what they've threatened to do and, as you said, go after the source of those missiles, the ships you're talking about. NBC's Courtney Kuby, great reporting here. Thanks so much. Real quick, Thanks. Richard, as you listen to those options uh, laid out, is there a concern about a confrontation with Russia and Iran? There is so much in the stew in Syria. There's concern about that. There's also concerns about getting drawn into uh, the the mire that uh, the muck that is that is the Syrian civil war, and it's one of the reasons that people ought to be really careful about taking you know, making getting rid of Assad or even weakening him. But what she what Courtney just laid out is the the paucity of U.S. options. Yeah. There's punitive options that even twice what we did last, so we shoot off a hundred cruise missiles. But so what? A week later, two weeks later, Syria is back in business. They want to use chemicals again. They will. Uh, there's not a great target set. There's the risks you talk about. Again, it's why I keep saying, don't just think punitively. Think long term. Think about ways we can make a difference in the long term future of Syria, forces on the ground against terrorists, things to help the Syrian people. That may not be as dramatic, but it may be more significant. All right. Coming up, a warning about 
fascism. Former Secretary of State Madeleine Albright is here with her new book. Morning Joe is back in a moment. Thanks for checking out MSNBC on YouTube and make sure you subscribe to stay up to date on the day's biggest stories and you can click on any of the videos around us to watch more for Morning Joe and MSNBC. Thanks so much for watching.